Hello, everybody, and welcome to this so is a series of interviews we're holding as part of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health's uh, annual conference, which will be in March next month, um, and it'll be a virtual conference. And as part of the interviews, uh, which will be of global health leaders, I'm very privileged today to interview Dr. Mohamed uh, Pate. Dr. Pate uh, is the uh, uh, Global Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank. He's also the director of the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children, and Adolescents. And amongst his many previous senior positions, he was the Minister of Health for uh, Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Pate has uh, an extraordinary history. He is a board certified physician in internal medicine. He holds an MBA from Duke University, another master's in health systems and management from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, Dr. Pate grew up in northern Nigeria. Dr. Pate, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you for having me. Dr. Pate, I have to ask you a personal question first as to how the arc of your life is fascinating, how you came from being a young man in northern Nigeria to ascending to become the health minister of your country. Can you share with us how, you, how that voyage happened? Well, thank you. I think uh, if I look back, in the formative stage of my career, I had a chance to work at the Medical Research Council Laboratories in the Gambia. That exposed me to the field of public health beyond just being a clinician. So over the course of the rest of my training as an internist and infectious disease specialist, I've always learned to make impact at the population level. And so the work that we did at the World Bank, in a way, deepened some of that in terms of understanding health programs, health reforms, and broader policy issues beyond just the clinical practice. So many years later, when I had a chance to support Nigeria's program to improve immunization, to eradicate poliomyelitis, we deployed all the experiences that we had in the preceding years uh, to do that. And I think that translated into significant results. So without being a politician in a traditional sense of the word, I was asked by President Goodluck Jonathan when he was elected in 2011, to join his cabinet, not only as the Minister of State for Health in the federal government, but also as a member of the economic team. And that enabled us to deep, deepen some of the reforms around improving access to primary health care. So in a way, uh, my career path has been defined by this quest to make impact at population level, at scale. And Nigeria offered a very good uh, opportunity uh, to actually do that where it mattered and in several other countries, even in the current work that we are doing at the World Bank and many other platforms that we have occupied over the years. Well, that's a, I mean, the very unusual skill set and experience from being both a clinician as well as a politician and working both domestically for Europe, for Nigeria, and now multilaterally with the, with the bank. As we're moving forward in this era, building forward better in the COVID-19 era, what do you see as some of the top key priorities in your position that we all need to support the bank in being able to, to uh, execute? I think it's important uh, to get the pandemic under control, which will require really uh, diligent application of what we know as basic public health measures, even as we roll out vaccines and strengthen health systems medium to longer term investing in health systems to strengthen them where it matters in the front lines to strengthen frontline health workers to improve the way we finance healthcare to make it more equitable and to also bring in other sectors because it's something that uh, over the long run over the long run i think we, we need to think multi-sectorally and at the global level to really uh, think about multi-stakeholder partnerships that are needed to mobilize the global community uh, to support countries so that no one is left behind. I think those are important, uh, let's say, agendas that we all have. The World Bank has played its part. I think it's still playing its part in the context of the pandemic. But I think it's something that requires a lot more in terms of other institutions. WHO has played an incredible leadership, Gavi and several others. So we have to work sort of at the global level, but also essentially supporting countries to have the pieces that are necessary to get out of the uh, shackles of the pandemic and also rebuild their health system in a way that they will be more resilient for future uh, infectious disease threats and pandemics that will likely come in the years and 
uh, period ahead. And, and, and you mentioned the the issue, the, the critical issue of strengthening countries' capacity themselves to be able to to move forward, to be able to create the, the development infrastructure that they, they need. I was on a conversation uh, this week with um, uh, individuals working in Liberia and Sierra Leone. I think we know that both countries, post Ebola, uh, post uh, horrible conflicts, each have only two psychiatrists per country. So we're working on mental health strengthening, but a pervasive challenge was the capacity within government ministries talented people but too few of them how is the world bank working to strengthen human capital within uh, low-income countries particularly at a, at a government level yes so so the sort of two dimensions to your question the sort of broad issue of human capital development in the context of uh, countries which is sort of the entirety of the population and what it means for overall productivity within country and that needs investment in education, social protection systems, as well as health. In the context of health, I think it's very important that children survive. So the mortality agenda, that they are not stunted, and that's also an important agenda, not only in health, but beyond health, and that they are healthy adults as they make the transitions in life. It requires the services to be delivered in the front lines to achieve those objectives. It requires reproductive health services uh, that would be necessary to in fact accelerate their demographic transition. So all of those efforts are really to transform societies in a way that they will get the dividend from the population that they have, not only in quantity, but also in the quality of the population, in the human capital that exists, that will contribute to their economic development. So um, I think the human capital agenda sort of provides a frame within the context of the broad World Bank's twin goals for what we do in health. Uh, when we talk about primary health care, service delivery, or whether we talk about public health in terms of resilience and health security, all of that is about safeguarding or advancing the agenda to preserve and grow human capital in countries. It requires all of government, but it also requires different sectors working together, including finance uh, ministries, as well as the health and other social sectors. It, it, being a former minister of, of health from Nigeria, knowing what you know now and you wish and what you knew then. What do you, if you were again a Minister of Health from a country, what would help you the most in strengthening your capacity to deliver the public goods that would be in your remit, whether you were in health or whether you were in justice or finance, as you mentioned? So it's clarity in terms of the outcome for the country and that building that ownership. I think at the country level, uh, that's sort of where the action is. And the global community can support countries where the leadership at the country level has stood up. So I'll organize uh, not only within the context of the government, uh, if it's the federal government, as well as the subnational units, but also other actors within the country, and then engage the international community to support that country to be able to move forward to achieve its own objective. At the end of the day, the pace of development and the act through which the countries pursue is largely dependent on the leadership of that country in owning that development agenda. It's not something that people will come from Washington DC or New York or Geneva and be able to solve for countries. At the end of the day, that's something that I will really push uh, for all uh, leaders basically to appreciate that. The solution lies in countries and the global community does well to the extent that it supports countries to achieve their national aspirations as well. And that fragility even hurts their own political aspirations too, if they don't deal don't deal with that. In strengthening, and just if I can uh, uh, add, add add to that, uh, Keith, is the, the sort of the, the, there's way that support can be uh, deployed at countries that could uh, strengthen national institutional capacity linked into some of the questions that you had, and there's a way that it could be deployed in a way that undermines it. So if it works through government systems and uh, strengthen even weak institutions, over time, they will get better. To the extent that actors go outside that, it could potentially undermine even the weak capacity and so provide a reason to continue to really go outside those weak systems. That's a very important um, uh, uh, point that national leaders have to insist uh, within the context of the uh, sovereignty that they have in their own countries 
to really strengthen their national institutions with global support. So if I sort of hark back on that's uh, those are excellent points to go back and to say if you if you had your minister's hat on again, what advice would you give to um, develop you know, other countries that wanted to engage with your country to be an effective partner with you uh, as a minister? What 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 are we doing? What could we do better as as partners? Should I say? With our colleagues in 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 uh, in countries that, uh, particularly the low-income countries, I, I think adapt the agendas uh, to the context of the problems that the countries are dealing with. Listen more and bring the contextual uh, knowledge and use their own systems and improve them, not bypass them. I'll say that the so uh, to give you a concrete example, for instance. Uh, when I was in government, I was uh, initially chief executive officer of a large, the largest parastatal in the Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria for a few years before I became minister. And uh, a bilateral partner uh, uh, brought um, additional resources to support us, but they were going to do that outside my institution hmm. as a standalone project. Um, and when I looked at the previous years, they had done similar things, but when the project closes, Essentially, all evidence of what it had done disappears. The vehicle, the staff, everybody sort of goes back to their normals, and there was no, not much to show. So I told them, I said, look, um, what is good for your currency is also good for the Naira. So if I allow you to just go and do your stand alone facility and report to your capitals, essentially, uh, you're saying that I can waste my resources. How can you help me? Uh, improve the quality of the spending from my own resources through the investment that you're making in my country. So come closer and improve the overall quality of the spending of the Nigerian Naira by working with us, by bringing in standards that we can learn from, but really reinforce it so that the day that you finish and leave, there will be something in terms of systems that we have strengthened together that will continue because the domestic resources are also as important. Sometimes that is not very appreciated, that in fact it's global resources, but also domestic resources. Imagine in the United States, if you have another country really supporting, uh, what is it that it's able to do with that? Uh, so I think that, that, that understanding is very important. And national leaders have a responsibility to remind external uh, uh, funders, whether they are the multilateral banks or grant financiers and others, to really align behind country-owned plans, priorities, and execute and hold each other accountable in doing so, so that the citizens and the populations are served. I mean, that's an excellent point that people perhaps don't don't realize that there is a burn and burn down of domestic resources that are utilized, and as you mentioned, are not appreciated perhaps in development initiatives as much as they should be. Are in your view, you know, you can build capacity to a point, but are we not, is there not a, are the relationships too short that we don't engage in a retention component that enables those, those um, uh, achievements to be able to fully take root? Are we, are we engaging a sufficient or insufficient period of time in the arc of development? I, I think there's a little bit of, of that. Governments themselves will need to think, so take a medium term frame, to think in terms of spending in health or whatever sector, with a medium uh, term frame. So they can be able to look at threats, costs, efficiencies, and cost correct over time. But development partners that come with one year, two year projects uh, to finish and go, don't get the most benefit in terms of the impact. It requires a bit of a medium longer term engagement to help countries uh, to improve their institutional capacities to achieve outcomes. If you are improving uh, mortality or strengthening public health preparedness, it's certainly not something that you do by parachuting in and out for a year or two. It's something that will take longer term engagement at the country level, not necessarily individuals, but institutions. So that when you commit, in fact, you, have, you deliberately commit in a way that you will stay long enough and give the policy makers a sense of predictability in terms of what you expect from it. Otherwise, uh, you keep sort of building, rebuilding, building and rebuilding uh, by different actors. 
and being better organized in terms of how you also uh, come around to support countries because you could do it in a way that just adds to the transaction that individual countries and their leaders will have to go through in terms of uh, uh, deploying some of what is being provided to them. And in the work that you're, you're doing, you're committed and working very hard to strengthen health systems in low resource countries. Where is, is the bank working also on strengthening capacity in terms of justice ministries and finance ministries and public works ministries? I had a, a very interesting conversation with a minister uh, from West African countries some years ago, and I asked him a question. I said, what's the most important thing that your country needs right now to improve the health of people? And I thought more physicians or nurses or public health workers. He said, no, no, no. I want my roads. I want roads to function properly. That's the most important thing. So patients in my country can get to the clinics that we have. Uh, are, is, can you share with us, is the bank help working with countries to build their own domestic administrative capacity in, in justice and finance and public works that would gird the work you're doing in health? Yes. So, so uh, starting from sort of take health financing, for instance, one of the most important things uh, countries can do overall to finance their health is to actually increase the share of government revenue that comes to the treasury, even before you increase the proportion that goes to health. Now, to do that, you also require the government to be effective in terms of collecting those revenues. So if there are leakages or there are missed opportunities, that doesn't help anyone. So it's a whole of government uh, issue. In terms of the bank, the bank is fundamentally a multi-sectoral institution. Not only health, broader human development, but also governance, infrastructure, and all of that. And that is the strength of the bank in terms of its engagement with its clients in the whole development sort of space that brings in multiple sectors to actually drive um, uh, national economic development. Health is one part of it. It's an important part of it. But these other elements are also very important. And the bank is very much uh, um, uh, engaged across with uh, the, the ministers of finance and all of that. And to say that the way the bank engages uh, kids is first is through the country partnership framework as with countries. Now, that framework usually is medium term and is developed after a systematic country diagnostic assessment of the constraints facing a country, not only in health, but across multiple sectors in terms of constraints to the growth of that country. And then that forms a basis for a medium term plan that prioritizes which sectors the bank will invest in with the country to achieve those particular developmental outcomes. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a multi-sectoral by its nature, uh, that health is also part of that. Just like within governments, multiple sectors operate, and health is one piece uh, in terms of how countries address uh, the challenges that they, they are facing. You, you you took the the, the question uh, from me uh, that I was going to ask you, and, and it's interesting just to see the gap that you you mentioned really between what's required for development to meet the sustainable development goals is between 1.5 to 2 trillion a year, I believe. Official development assistance, about 153 billion a year, a huge gap. But as you said, you, you know, you and your colleagues at the World Bank are, are across its five organizations trying, working really hard to strengthen countries' ability to generate revenues themselves to pay for the social goods that they require. So I have to ask you, because and congratulations on becoming the chair of the new Lancet Commission on Global Health Diplomacy and Cooperation. It, it, you know, it's too premature to really ask where that will wind up, of course. But you know, from your multiple perspectives, how do you see the in multi-international community helping to support the bank more effectively? Because the bank is us. Well, the bank is all uh, is, is one out of several institutions in the global landscape. So and the commission is chaired by Jeffrey Sachs. Uh, we have a task force that I co-chair with Maria Fernanda Espinoza and, uh, and uh, Lan, uh, who is also a colleague uh, based in China. Now, um, when you look at the landscape, and based on the lessons uh, that we've learned over the last one year in the COVID-19 pandemic, the global uh, uh, landscape, in fact, required multiple institutions to cooperate to solve the complex issues that the pandemic has put forward, whether it's vaccines, development and distribution, whether it's diagnostic, whether it's therapeutics, or whether it's sort of strengthened the role of WHO as a lead normative agency, or even financing agencies like the multilateral uh, banks, bank is one, 
or other uh, grant uh, making institutions like the Global Fund and Gavi. So how do we all cooperate along with private sector actors to solve this complex challenge that is facing the world? So in a way, um, the task force is thinking through alongside the various reviews that are underway in terms of IHR, in terms of IPPR, the independent review of the WHO, uh, to see what recommendations can we make to build back uh, or to build forward something that is actually fit for purpose in terms of global cooperation. The single most important thing, in my view, it's really it being inclusive of all voices. Build them back in a way that is not inclusive, that excludes other uh, 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 parts of the world, will not necessarily give us the required level of agility or security that we need into the future. And so how do we make sure that, in fact, we balance also the global the, the role that country institutions, regional institutions also would have to play in yeah, terms I mean, of preparedness and response. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, uh, absolutely, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the building forward better as the international community is really understandably being, being jarred by the, by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And as we look forward in trying to strengthen health systems, can you share with us you know, your views on how strengthening public health systems can actually address both non-communicable diseases and infectious diseases. Uh, and by, by infectious diseases, I mean as, as, a, as a platform to prevent, detect, and respond to prevent potential future, future uh, epidemics, which will certainly come. Reimagining and strengthening frontline primary healthcare services will be key uh, to, let's say, sensing stopping outbreaks uh, very early, but also in terms of preventing NCDs and also addressing this in nearer uh, the, the communities and taking advantage of things that are in, uh, uh, in the horizon, as we've seen in the pandemic, digital uh, technologies that can enable uh, patients to interact with their providers. So really think about, about the platform for service delivery that is as close to the patient as possible, to the person as possible in the front lines and reinforcing that. So for the bank, that is one of the uh, uh, core pillars of our strategy, to ensure that our clients are striving towards high quality health systems with uh, reimagined primary healthcare systems at the foundation that also enables them uh, to, let's say, sense through surveillance systems and be able to have the required human resources in the front lines to respond to infectious disease outbreaks, in tandem respond to the emerging uh, non-communicable disease, disease that are, of course, on the rise in many parts of the world. So it, it's not either or, it needs an integrated mindset. Uh, but at the end of the day, it has to work at the front lines. It boils down to whether someone in a village or in a remote area is able to interact with the health system, to get the essential services that they needed some of which are very basic. And I, I, this is a question I didn't, uh, I didn't think of before, but I know that the World Bank, you did an excellent report on the digital divide, by the way. I recommend anybody taking a look at that because it really is outstanding. And you know, at CUGH, we've been trying to think of how we can mobilize the IT sector to be able to think of ways in which uh, individuals in low resource communities, communities can get access to broadband. Is there any advice or, or thoughts that you have on, on how, how low resource communities can potentially access broadband more effectively? Are there ways the bank is looking at bridging that gap? I, I think um, it's the issue of scale. Whatever it is for you to get the most impact of it, it needs to be scalable. And that requ requires thinking about it sort of from a structured perspective, meaning that anchoring around national policies and the regulatory frameworks. Uh, uh, so just sort of who owns the data? How is it protected? And how do providers actually get trained to use it? All those elements are so key, not just the innovation itself. The innovation is important, has to be there, has to be financed, has to get to the hands of those who will use them, either providers or the, client or the patients. But at the end of the day, it should be anchored within sort of the um, sort of national policy landscapes, uh, including the regulatory uh, uh, environment as well. As well. Yeah. And, and I, I, as we as we're looking thinking through forward, we to the COVID nineteen um, uh, 
challenge, which is really, of course, a, a spillover event of a zoonotic disease. Um, the environment health component, so critically important to your to your mandate on improving nutrition uh, and health for populations. Can you share? Is the bank working on work to integrate community-based conservation, which we know can actually generate resources to address environmental challenges, the social determinants of health, uh, non-communicable diseases, infectious diseases. It's a quadruple benefit by investing in community-based conservation and working with primarily rural communities, you can actually generate the resources for them that will enable them to improve their well-being. Is there any work the bank is doing in that space that you're aware of? Yes, I think there's a, I think a solid uh, track record of uh, program being uh, done at the bank that is touching on environmental health. Mm. Uh, because the bank, as I mentioned, is a multi-sectoral institution. And my colleagues in social development, working with colleagues in the health uh, 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 group, are collaborating and supporting countries, not only in financing, but also in technical support and policy advice um, in terms of uh, pollution, air pollution, uh, in terms of water pollution, in terms of just uh, uh, overall environmental health within the context of the uh, investment that the bank is supporting in, in client countries. So the bank has a program on, on that, and I think it would be worthwhile sort of looking at that more closely. Um, yeah. Good. And I have just two last questions, Dr. Pate. You've been very generous with, with your time. Um, the, the, the second last one is really, you're the head of the Global Financing Facility for Women, Children, Adolescents. Could you share with us what the, the Global Financing Facility is with the audience, please? Yes. So the Global Financing Facility is a partnership uh, hosted at the bank since uh, 2015. So it's six, getting into six years now. Uh, it's really within the context of everyone, every child, uh, trying to uh, eliminate preventable mortality, morbidity uh, for women, children, and adolescents all over the world. It works in 36 countries, uh, really building around uh, country-led platforms that countries themselves lead on, and they own, and their investment cases that prioritizes the reproductive health uh, services for women, uh, preventing maternal mobility and mortality, uh, and uh, newborn and child uh, mobility and mortality, as well as nutrition, providing technical assistance and tools for countries to be able to prioritize and engage in communities and civil society actors in those countries to achieve the results uh, that uh, are necessary, in fact, for the half of those countries to achieve the SDGs by 2030. So the GFF is a partner that has mobilized resources from uh, core donors in the multi-donor trust fund that the bank then uses to incentivize the countries to use their IDA allocations in their own uh, 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 countries based on the plans that they themselves want. So it's a different model of development than sort of going and prescribing for countries what they need to do, but it's one that is focused on really uh, their own leadership building their own national institutions, providing them with tools, uh, the analytical support, and also the platform for engaging with several actors within their own context to achieve the results that are very important for them. And I want to really thank you for the for the work that you you and your teams are doing on reducing stunting, which just robs children of of their potential in in, in just egregious uh, and preventable ways. Uh, so the last question I have before before I turn it over to you to see if any any additional points, Dr. Pate, is most of the institutions that are coming to the consortium are academic institutions around the world. How can academic institutions, uh, can they engage the bank in any way or how can they engage the bank and also to support the work that you and your colleagues are doing to reduce poverty, extreme poverty and improve the sustainable future for, for, for everybody? Well, so several of the institutions in the consortium are already engaged uh, with the bank in multiple fronts. Uh, in many of the studies that we do, the research uh, activities, the uh, data tracking and monitoring work, we do it in collaboration with many academic institutions, uh, both in the context of COVID, but also even before COVID. And there are many collaborations uh, that we have that are at the country level in terms of technical assistance that is provided. And institutions can also add their voices, uh, their independent research 
really inform the policy choices that the bank makes but also its clients are making on a day to day. So uh, academic institutions are a key part of this landscape. And even more important now, uh, in terms of what uh, onslaught uh, the scientific community has been under in terms of even just the COVID-19 pandemic, that going forward, that the voices of scientists of academic institutes actually comes to play in the global landscape to shape the choices that are being made, to monitor and to also uh, help everyone learn from what is going well and what is not going well. And, and, and yeah. Wonderful. And Dr. Pate, you've been very kind with your time. Were there any other additional points that you wanted to, to make for our global audience that will be listening to you? No, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you very much. Well, it's always a pleasure to see you, Dr. Pate. Thank you so much for your time. We've been really privileged to have Dr. Muhammad Ali Pate, uh, the Global Director for Health, Nutrition and Population at the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Pate, we wish you very well in all of the work that you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I appreciate the time you spent with us today. Thank you. Great. So I think.